the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Persecution and the Inquisition and it deals with chapter 14 of the wonderful book I'm reading for the moment to you and discussing with you, All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael Desemlian. Persecution and the Inquisition. Also, of course, we know this is a subject like the Vatican and the political power like the things we've spoken to about before. This is a subject like Mars and Saints, the previous chapters. There you can write your own books on. You can even write probably your own complete libraries on. And books and libraries full of have been written about this subject. Especially persecution and the Inquisition. The wonderful book from John Fox Acts and Monuments, which is better known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, is only one of those. And Hore Apocalyptice from E.B. Elliot is a wonderful work that explains the Revelation, the whole book of Revelation also, including the persecution and the Inquisition going on in there. There are so many books written on this subject that I don't even know where to start. Everything is interesting to read in that regard because this is history that is suppressed today. When about 60 years ago or 50 years ago also in American schools it was still at that time uh, obligatory to read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs or at least in the churches while getting educated in the spirit of Christ. Today those books are not even mentioned anymore. And this history is taken out of our knowledge. And every part of history that is not taught to us, that we are oblivious on, we won't see when it repeats itself in the future. And the persecution and the Inquisition is that, in that way a very interesting chapter to read now, because I am sure and I'm not a prophet, but I am sure that the persecution by the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church will not only continue, but will go into a higher gear. Seeing that we are now at the end of the Jubilee year and coming to 2017 and 500 years of Reformation, I think there will be some significant significant and important changes in that in the future to come. I don't say tomorrow, I don't say next week, 
but prepare. Jesus Christ said, in this life, we who follow him will have tribulation. And I'm not speaking of a seven-year tribulation, as so many futurists do. But I'm speaking of tribulation, persecution and the Inquisition. So starting with chapter 14. Those who are in the battle to defend our Christian heritage are concerned <coughs> by the Vatican's use of the media to make heroes out of villains and its long-standing practice of canonizing or beatifying those who for centuries have been wildly regarded as persecutors of the true church. Wasn't that something that we read, that we read about in the last chapter? when it was said, or when the question was asked, martyrs or traitors? Didn't I go into something quite similar like this here again? One long-standing example of this is Saint Dominic, who founded the Dominican Order, instituted the notorious Inquisition, and took on the primary responsibility for persecuting heretics, i.e. Jews or Bible-believing Christians. Another in the same tradition is Saint Ignatius Loyola, whose Society of Jesus, an altogether more sophisticated organization, was needed by the Vatican to take on the same role after the Reformation. It needed to take on the role of counter-reformation. Every time when you read Jesuit, you can read counter-reformation. You can read counter Bible, counter God. The present Pope, and as you all know by the writing of this book, this is John Paul II, proposed the canonization of Queen Isabella of Spain in 1992 to coincide with the 500th anniversary of Columbus' voyage to the New World. Queen Isabella did launch the Great Explorer, but she also launched the Spanish Inquisition under Torquemada and expelled 200,000 Jews from Spain. Nevertheless, Isabella's cause was represented at the Vatican as for, quote, one of the great Christians of history, unquote. Protests from Muslims, however, large numbers of whom were also expelled by the fervent queen, as well as from Jews, finally obliged the Vatican to reconsider. So in September 1987 it was intended that Father Junipero Serra, the 18th century founder of the Californian missions system and an active member of the Spanish Inquisition, be beatified during Antichrist Pope John Paul II's 17th September 1987 visit to Carmel near Monterey, California. Two, uh, for two years leading up to the papal visit, a commemorative United States Junipero Serra postage stamp had been used by Americans for most international letters, and this together with other public relations activities had been used to prepare public opinion. Now, on this postage stamp for Junipero Serra, which was used in the United States, there's an interesting footnote that we read on page 155 of the book. The United States Post Office commemoration of Serra contrasts sharply with the decision of the British Post Office not, listen closely, not to issue a commemorative stamp for the 500th anniversary of Thomas Cranmer's birth in 1989. Cranmer, who was Archbishop of Canterbury under three monarchs, was founder of the Church of England, joint author of the Book of Common Prayer, and, with bishops Latimer and Ridley, a martyr of Christ at Oxford. The post office decision not to commemorate Cranmer's anniversary with a stamp issue was presumably well-intentioned to avoid offence and to assist ecumenical unity. But, for all that, it amounts to a denial of the true history of our church and nation. And I 
could not agree more. When it comes to venerating Protestants in England, they forget about the 500th birth uh, anniversary of Thomas Cranmer. And in America, then they publish this postage stamp for Junipero Serra. Yeah. Martyrs or traitors? What does the Roman Catholic Church actually celebrate? They take what they call martyrs that are actually traitors and turn the traitors into holy people and martyrs. White is black, as the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells me so. Isn't that a directive of the Jesuits? Isn't that actually a directive of the Roman Catholics anyway? to believe what the Roman Catholic hierarchy says, what the Pope says, and not what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. Now, however, the indigenous Indians, still dealing with Junipero Serra, the indigenous Indians promised to protest and Kumash Indian leader Chek Wish Ho U spoke to the media of, quote, Indian demonstrations like they have never seen before in all their lives." Unquote. He recalled the experience of the Sarah mission when conversion was a brutal process. The Indian people were quote, brought through baptism into slavery. Unquote. They were beaten with whips, chained in shackles and stocks, made to work the crops and construct mission buildings, and they died like flies. And when you came to the big persecution of the American indigenous people in the, late, in the latter part of the 19th century, wasn't there a person who said that only a dead Indian is a good Indian? The American press reported that a Vatican spokesman had said that the Pope did not beatify Father Sarah, quote, because of problems with timing and Vatican procedural requirements, unquote. Well, this is, of course, <laughs> a very, very weak excuse from the Roman Catholic Church, eh? because of problems and with timing and Vatican procedural requirements? Come on! <laughs> However, strangely, the Catholic Herald subsequently reported that the Pope did actually beatify Father Sarah during the visit. But, listen closely, the press was so much preoccupied by his meeting with Clint Eastwood, you know that actor? the mayor of Carmel, that perhaps for that reason, <laughs> perhaps, yeah, they may not have covered the beatification. <laughs> so this is what they do. This is what they always do. They put something else in the news in front of you to keep you, keep you busy. And behind the scenes, they do everything they wanted to do all the way anyway. Given the declared strength of feeling against it, this was surely most helpful for the Vatican. An embarrassing protest was avoided, and the Pope was thus able to describe Sarah at the ceremony as, quote, a shining example of Christian virtue and missionary spirit, a defender and champion of the Indians, unquote where we could just read before that the Chumash Indian leader said he recalled the experience of the Sarah missions when conversion was a brutal process. The Indian people were brought through baptism into slavery. They were beaten with whips, chained in shackles and stocks, made to work the crops and construct mission buildings, 
and they died like flies. This, in the eyes of the Pope, is a shining example of Christian virtue and missionary spirit, a defender and champion of the Indians. What hypocrisy is that? In December 1989, Pope John Paul II canonized the first Canadian-born saint, Marie-Marguerite Duville, and praised the heroic charity of her work among Montreal's poor. However, members of Montreal's black Catholic community expressed outrage at the canonization, pointing out that Saint Marguerite inherited about a dozen slaves from her husband, and allegedly bought and sold dozens of others. Very Christian, eh? There has been Jewish protest, Jewish protest over the decision to canonize Edith Stein, who died at Auschwitz along with millions of others of Jewish origin. But Catholic convert Stein, known in the Roman Church as Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, asked God to accept her life in atonement, quote, for the unbelief of the Jews, unquote. She has already been beatified despite protests from the Jews who feel the Pope is trying to cash in on the Holocaust. The other Catholic martyr of Auschwitz, Father Maximilian Kolbe, who is said to have given his life to have saved the father of three children, quote, edited a horrible anti-Semitic daily paper before the war, unquote, according to Observer correspondent Neil Asherson. Colby has already been made a saint of the Church of Rome. We come to look at another Roman Empire. The Inquisition, led by the Dominicans and the Jesuits, who in 1542 took the Inquisition from the Dominicans over, as you can read in Tapasosi's book Rulers of Evil. The Inquisition, led by the Dominicans and the Jesuits, was usually early on the scene following each territorial acquisition of the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the 16th and 17th century. The methods used, which all too often were similar to those used by Serra in California or the Nazi-backed Eustaches in Croatia, sowed the seeds of reaction and aversion that have proved to be a barrier for true missionaries ever since. Albert Close, former council member of the Protestant Truth Society, writes of the Jesuit mission to Indonesia in 1559 that, quote, conversion was wonderfully shortened by the cooperation of the colonial governors whose militia offered the natives the choice of the musket ball or of baptism. What does that mean? Either get shot or convert. Convert or die. Our way or the highway. It was this type of Christianity which the Chinese government ignored in 1913 when it requested Protestant Britain and North America to call on God Almighty to bless that great nation in the hour of her first birth of constitutional government. They ignored the Pope because they did not regard Romanism as Christianity in any shape or form. Now, we are 100 years later than 1913, in China, 2016, and 100 years before, the Chinese ignored the Pope because they did not regard Romanism as Christianity in any shape or form. And how is that today? The Chinese judged the missionaries and their teachings by their fruits. As the Bible always says, by their fruits you will know them. The Chinese were very smart a hundred years ago. 
And now you can see on how they work today together with the Vatican, how they dumped down that nation also within a hundred years. And they dumped down United States of America and they dumped down Germany, the whole European Union, the whole Europe. They dumped us all down because they took away our real history knowledge. But a hundred years ago, the Chinese ignored the Pope because they did not regard Romanism as Christianity. Exactly, Romanism never was Christianity. But it continues here in Japan, following the activities of the Roman Catholic missionaries, which culminated in the setting on foot of a Catholic army of 30,000 Japanese, which marched against the civil and military representatives of the Japanese government. The exclusion edict of 1639 was introduced. Quote, For the future, let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even in the quality of ambassadors, and this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death. Unquote. So this is the exclusion edict of 1639 in Japan. Fifty years later, in about 1688-1689, with the glorious revolution in England, they had the same stuff over there in England. 1773, Pope Clement XIV so-called abolished the Jesuits, never to be reinstalled. And how long did that take? Right. 41 years, until 1814, and they were reinstalled. The paper where things like this is on written is not even worth the ink that is spread on it. For the future let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even in the quality of ambassadors, and this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death. Well, as long as the sun illuminates the world, how about God illuminates the world instead? Anyway, given all that we have been looking at, it is instructive just to consider this statement alongside the exclusion clauses in the Bill of Rights, which was enacted in England just 50 years afterwards, as I told you, 1689. Japan had thrown open her doors eagerly when Western navigators and explorers had first arrived. Now they were firmly closed and she retreated again into feudal isolationism. Following the experience with Vatican imperialism, she became convinced that quote unquote Christianity, no, you should read Romanism, represented nothing but a quote torturous Western device for political and religious religious domination. Unquote. That is the problem. It's always Christianity that they misuse and they give Christianity. They give Jesus Christ. They give the gospel. They give the loving God of this world a bad name. And I know the Bible says Satan is the God of this world, but I still say that our Creator is in control of everything. So the God of this world, to me, still is my Creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Became convinced that Christianity represented nothing but a torturous Western device for political and religious domination. Political and religious domination. That's it all about. Roman Catholicism in the first place is a political power. Well, what I've just read, you can read that in the book from Avro Manhattan, Vietnam. Why did we go? Since then, and right up to the post-war period, Second World War post-period that means, the Japanese, a people with long memories, very much conditioned by their history and steeped in ancestor worship, have been deeply suspicious of quote-unquote Christians, yes, of Romanists, I'd say, 
It is not surprising, therefore, that Japan is the least evangelized major nation on earth today. And this does also perhaps help to explain the cruelty and savagery of Japanese atrocities in the Pacific War, although, of course, it does not excuse them, but it helps to explain why there are such savages. Because don't forget, they threw out Roman Catholicism because they thought they threw out Christianity with that. At the same time, they didn't allow real Christianity to take place in their country. And by that, they are heathen. They are pagans. They are sun worshippers. They are evolutionists. They are cruel people. And they will do things to you that you cannot even dream of, that a Western person would probably not even be capable of doing to you. And they proved that during the wars, in the Pacific War that they fought, as the author writes. This also perhaps ex helps to explain the cruelty and savagery, although, of course, it does not excuse them but it helps us to understand where their mindset comes from. Vatican plans to turn 1992 into the triumphal celebration of 500 years of discovery and evangelization in Latin America are beginning to backfire, wrote John Roca in The Guardian in April 1991. Quote, as indigenous groups meet to denounce the Catholic Church's role in the genocide, which they say discovery brought for them. To celebrate the 500 years is to celebrate a massacre, said Indian leaders in Mexico. In Ecuador, they concluded that what had happened was, quote, an invasion which brought genocide through the contagion with European diseases, exploitation and separation of parents and children." Unquote. In Peru, the South American Indigenous Council went further, saying, quote, If observers from international human rights organizations had been present during the invasion and the immediate years afterwards, then the Spanish state and the Catholic Church would have been universally condemned for their atrocities against the Indian peoples. The genocide perpetrated against the Indians makes Hitler's genocide against the Jews seem a minor deed. Unquote. You can read this in the Guardian International News section, April 20th, 1991. Imagine something like that being printed in a German newspaper. Hitler's genocide against the Jews seem a minor deed in comparison to what Roman Catholics did to indigenous Indians in South and Middle America. Never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. 20th century Inquisition. And we go into Croatia. Before I go into this, I want to tell you that I read the book Behind the Dictators from Leo Herbert Lehman, and I can advise you that if you want to mo know more about that, um, the Inquisition in Croatia in the 20th century during the Second World War, go to my book readings of Behind the Dictators, and also make sure that you read Avro Manhattan, The Vatican's Holocaust, which is published in 1986 and also deals with that. But now in this book, All Roads Lead to Rome, the next part of chapter 14, which we are reading, Persecution and the Inquisition, the next part is called 20th Century Inquisition in Croatia. We don't need to go back so far in history to catch another glimpse of this same evangelizing spirit between, between uh, quotation marks. According to a memorandum in the United States Army's Council uh, Counterintelligence Corps documents, 
dated September 12, 1947. Agents hunting escaped Nazi war criminals after World War II purposely avoided capturing one man because, quote, his contacts are so high and his present position so compromising to the Vatican that any extradition of the subject would deal a staggering blow to the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. We can read that in Battle Cry from Chick Publications. The man that we are dealing with here is, or was, Anton Pavelic, head of the new nation state of Croatia, which was carved out of Yugoslavia during the Second World War. During Pavelic's four year reign, he and Roman Catholic prelate Archbishop Alois Stepanak pursued a convert or die policy among the 900,000 Greek, Orthodox, Serbs, Jews and others, Protestants, in Croatia. Does that sound familiar? Convert or die? What did we read before? The bullet of the musket or baptism, right? History repeats itself. Now, 200,000 of the 900,000 that I've just read, 200,000 were converted. 700,000 who choose to die were tortured, burned, buried alive or shot after digging their own graves. This appalling persecution carried out by the Eustaches included many of the worst atrocities of the war. Certainly the mutilations were horrific. The savagery was terrible. The Catholic Church did not leave the execution of a religious war to the secular arm. Oh no, she was there herself, openly ignoring precautions and bolder than she had been for a very long time. Wielding the hatchet or dagger, pulling the trigger, organizing the massacre, the Roman Catholic priesthood became again its own instrument of inquisition, as in the days of Torquemada. Many of the Eustachi officers were priests or friars sworn to fight, quote, with dagger or gun, unquote, for the triumph of Christ and Croatia. As we can read in Avro Manhattan's book, The Vatican's Holocaust. Priests played a prominent role in the closing or takeover of Orthodox churches, the seizure of church records and the interrogation of the Orthodox clergy. They also supervised concentration camps and organized the torture of many of the victims. French author Edmond Paris, who was born a Roman Catholic and has written a very thorough account of this terrible massacre, Convert or Die, has said, quote, It is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 20th century, just because it happened to belong to another ethical and racial group and had inherited the Christianity of Byzantium rather than that of Rome." Unquote. Convert or die from Edmond Paris. The world doesn't in fact know and is thus unable to understand fully what has happened in Yugoslavia again in 1991 and also in 1998 and 1999, which of course happened after the writing of this book. Again, the Serbs were persecuted, and of course the Serbs were alleged being the perpetrators. So, the Roman Catholic Church use the same policy over and over and over again. They did it during World War II, they did it in 1991 in Yugoslavia, that was when communism broke down and they broke the country in pieces again, 
and then you had the atrocities that were committed between 1998 and the year 2000 which I remember as a German quite well because the German military even went there and again those were deeds committed against the Orthodox Serbs. But of course, it was differently told in the media, which is totally and 100% controlled by the Roman Catholic Church, as you of course know, through papers like Intermirifica and Miranda Process. I cannot help myself every time to repeat this. Whatever you read in the media is Roman Catholic propaganda. Writing in September 1991, Sunday Telegraph writer Andrew Roberts expressed surprise that, quote, in the present crisis almost the entire Western media have chosen to champion the Croats, unquote. How does that come? Because the Croats was a country carved out of Yugoslavia during the Second World War and was completely Catholic, huh? Ah, it was Catholic! Oh, so he goes on to ask the question, quote, How are the Serbs expected to react to the decision to adopt the Eustachis checkered symbol as the Croatian national flag? In Krajina, it takes longer than the 45 minute attention span of today's CNN broadcaster to forget the way Franciscan friars participated in the slaughter of Serbs in Croatian Bosnia. Orthodox Serbs were promised protection if they converted to Catholicism and were then killed after they entered the churches as the priests looked on. Unquote. We can read that in the Sunday Telegraph from the 15th of September 1991. In his authoritative book, Roman Catholicism, Professor Lorraine Butner records his own reaction to such enormous crimes being covered up at the time and since. Quote, Most astonishing was the manner in which those crimes were ignored or hushed up at the time by almost all news services, although similar massacres of Jews in Germany were given the widest publicity. Another demonstration of how subtly and efficiently Roman clericalism ex uh, exerts its influence over the press and radio. But now a French author, who was born a Roman Catholic, has told the story in his fully documented books the Vatican against Europe and genocide in satellite Croatia. Another French author, Ave Laurier, also a Roman Catholic by birth, has recorded the same events in his Assassins in the Name of God, both Paris or Paris, and Laurier, the two authors, put the responsibility squarely on the priests of the Church of Rome. Unquote from the book Roman Catholicism by Lorraine Batner. By the way, a book that I will in the future read on my channel too. The attempt to create the entirely Roman Catholic independent state of Croatia was accompanied by a persecution so ferocious that it is difficult to find a parallel in all of history. In the Spanish Inquisition under Torquemada, some 125,000 people perished by burning, torture and hunger. The St. Bartholomew Massacre in France in 1572 accounted for 100,000 victims in about a month's time. But the Inquisition of the Serbian Orthodox and Jews and Protestants by the Croatian Catholics was more terrible and on a much bigger scale with 750,000 Serbs killed in just four years. Pavelic's crimes were covered up by the Vatican's top-level contacts among the Allied powers and he was allowed to join many other Roman Catholic war criminals who were spirited out of Europe through the Roman Church's monastery escape route. This quote-unquote red line was managed by a Croatian clergyman in association with the Vatican, according to the September 1991 obituary written for Klaus Barbie in The Independent. 
In 1959, Pavelic returned from Argentina and Chile for medical treatment in a German hospital in Madrid, Spain. On the day he died, a few months later, his personal benediction was given by Pope John XXIII. His collaborator in these unspeakable crimes, Alois Stepanak, was made a cardinal by Antichrist, Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, Eugenio Pacelli, after the Second World War, although he was arrested in 1946 and sentenced to life imprisonment by the Tito regime of Yugoslavia at that time. Stepanak had twice visited Pius XII in Rome in 1942, reporting on the conversions of 244,000 Serbs to Roman Catholicism. Remember, they killed the other 750,000. His death in 1960 aroused a powerfully orchestrated concert of lamentation and praise in every Catholic country. He had been treated like a martyr in Roman Catholic circles because he had been held for five years under house arrest. Cardinal Spellman in New York even named a parochial high school after him. The man who wrote in 1941, Hitler has been sent by God, and who wrote in a pastoral letter that was being done in Croatia, uh, what was being done in Croatia by the Gustachi regime was the Lord's work will hereafter wear a halo and be canonized, predicted Edmond Paris in Ustashi, a free world. Well, Stepanek's successor, Cardinal Franjo Kuarik, is pressing the Yugoslav state to revoke the sentence as a prelude to Stepanek's canonization, according to the independent newspaper of November 1990. So the prophetic words of Edmond Paris are being fulfilled. There is great concern that Croatian nationalism, powered once more by that same religious spirit, is rising again. Although what the Serbs see as their preemptive military action in neighboring Bosnia Herzegovina will deter it. Medjugorje is a Croat village in Herzegovina. The 17 million pilgrims said to have visited the Marian shrine there during the past nine years are mostly unaware that the Franciscans who run the church and champion the visionaries and passionate nationalists who even claim that the Virgin speaks pure Croat rather than Serbo-Croat as most Yugoslavs still call their language. The most extreme Croat nationalists have been to or hope to go to Medjugorje. Pictures of Medjugorje Church and the Statue of Mary often appear among nationalistic manifestations and are propped up against the cathedral walls during Mass, as we can read in Richard West's Brother Devil's Legacy, the independent magazine from the 10th of November 1990. The square in front of that same cathedral in Zagreb, which is the capital of Croatia, is to be named after Cardinal Alois Stepinak, 40 years after he was imprisoned for what are now described only as his quote-unquote alleged crimes. Quote, he is a great hero in our country and wildly admired for his courage, unquote, said Mr. Michenko Zagar. General Secretary of the new ruling Christian Democratic Union. Croat National Guardsmen pray at the tomb of the man who nearly 50 years before, on Easter Day 1941, from the pulpit in Zagreb's Cathedral, had announced the illegal establishment of the independent state of Croatia and had backed and made respectable the most ruthless, cruel and barbaric regime that quite possibly the world has ever known. Yeah, really? I think we still have to ask ourselves the questions. 
bartenders or traitors. The modern Inquisition this chapter ends with. The rehabilitation of the Inquisition of old is something of an article of faith for the Vatican. For the Inquisition is alive and well and, within the restrictive limits placed on it by democratic freedoms, as powerful as ever. Roman Catholic author, theologian and former priest Peter de Rosa, in his 1988 book Vicars of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy, writes about the modern Inquisition. Quote, Located at Casa Santa, the Pope's house on the corner is known locally as the Palace of the Inquisition. In recent years, having had a bad press, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Inquisition, like the Soviet secret police, had been renamed more than once. In 1908, this oldest of Rome's sacred congregations became the Holy Office. From 1967, it changed to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and this is the name it still carries today. The present secretary, during the writing of this book, remind you, the present secretary and chief executive, the Grand Inquisitor of old, is the Bavarian Cardinal Ratzinger, but the president has ever been the reigning pontiff. Bavarian Cardinal Ratzinger. He became, after the death of Pope John Paul II, the reigning Pope during the writing of this book, Pope Benedict XVI, after having led the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the Holy Office, the Inquisition, for 25 years. And then... His successor became Mario Borgoglio, Pope Francis I, a Jesuit of the Fourth Vow. Do you see what people they put up there to be the White Pope? Do you Catholics have any idea what people you venerate? Elsewhere, Professor de Rosa describes Ratzinger, quote, the Pope's right-hand man, picking up the phone and calling a priest in Los Angeles, telling him either to suppress his researches into the views of bishops on celibacy or to pack his bags and leave within the hour. It is not surprising that theologians are removed from their teaching posts, priests are suspended from office for opposing non-infallible teaching. It is not surprising that a bishop is disciplined for acting as Jesus acted, ministering to the downcast, refusing to excommunicate anyone who has sincerity or love in his heart. Unquote. It is this same Cardinal Ratzinger who has pronounced on ARCIC, you, may, you remember that is the Anglican Roman Catholic Interchurch Community, and ecumenical progress, seeking more concessions on the doctrine of salvation and the role of the Church. In the high-profile Vatican of the last years of the millennium, the Cardinal's public image is important too. According to the Catholic Herald, quote, austere Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, dubbed in Italy the latter-day inquisitor for his doctrinaire guidance as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, is tipped to become the start turn of a new Italian television station, unquote. The article says that the Vatican strongly denies financing it and the initial cash was provided by two Roman Opus Dei businessmen, as we can read in the Catholic Herald, January the 13th of 1989. Opus Dei. We already dealt with them in this book. Look it up. Another extreme secret part of the, uh, part of the secret society of the Society of Jesus. 
So, and because chapter 15 is quite short, only um, two pages altogether, I will go into chapter 15, which is called Concern of Roman Catholics, and read that to you too. But before I do that, I have to tell you this Concern of Roman Catholics deals with a website that you can look up that is called MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com www.MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com in one word. That's a website of ultra-Catholics who want a 100% return to the Trent policies, yeah? Council of Trent policies. And they call everything that happened after the Second Vatican Council anti-Christian. Not accepting, of course, that the office of the papacy, also before, now, and in the future, always will be the office of the Antichrist of the Bible. But they are really right-wing Catholics, extreme Catholics, and um, this chapter, Concern of Roman Catholics, deals with people like that, who see it and identify it like that. So that's just some extra information. You can watch the website and look it up for yourself and make up your own mind about that. Anyway, concern about the direction of the papacy has been voiced by many within the Roman Church. Foremost critic of John Paul II pontificate among Catholic prelates was traditionalist Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who died in March 1991, aged 85. Lefebvre, who was excommunicated in 1988 for consecrating bishops into his society, named after the conservative Pope Pius X, complained that the Polish pontiff, quote, speaks all the time about the rights of man, about ecumenism, not about truth, unquote. As we can read in the Catholic Herald from the 29th of March, 1991. Peter de Rosa, who we have already learned got to know in the previous chapter, the author of the book Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy, and Pierce Compton, author of The Broken Cross, both committed Roman Catholics. Yeah? They are both committed Roman Catholics, wrote the books from which we have quoted out of their concern for the Church of Rome, which each of them, from a different perspective, sees as being it in great danger. The rep they represent two entirely different positions within Roman Catholicism. On the one hand, Professor de Rosa is opposed to what he sees as the doctrinaire, autocratic and backward-looking nature of the papacy under John Paul II, which for him contrasts very unfavorably with the progressive and compassionate pontificate of John XXIII. Compton, on the other hand, was deeply concerned by the liberal departures of Vatican II and the accompanying disregard of ancient and hallowed tradition and orthodoxy. You get it? Now take a look at the website that I just told you, mostholyfamilymonastery.com. Get a look on that and you will understand what Compton, the author of the book, uh, the Broken Cross, Pierce Compton, stands for. This view, which is represented most strongly by the ultra-conservative wing of the Roman Church, led by Archbishop Lefebvre, underlines the fact that the ecumenical initiative launched by the Vatican II is by no means carrying all Catholics with it. This certainly applies to Anglo-Catholics too, and the formation of the High Church group, Church in Danger, is an expression of their unwillingness to be swept along with the lowest common denominator. The Roman Catholic Church is extraordinary in its ability to face both ways at the same time, while appearing to be firm and clear. The John Paul II papacy displays this as much as any previous pontificate. Although widely perceived to be both conservative and orthodox, this pope, 
according to Dr. Malachi Martin, who worked closely with him, quote, can still cause devout Catholics to question the, le the legitimacy of a pontiff who has made a conscious decision to allow the Roman Catholic Church to fester into corruption, masonry, satanic pedophilia, and outrageous disobedience on the part of the clergy and laity, unquote, from the book the Keys of This Blood by Malachi Martin. Dr. Martin, who in spite of this observation generally appears sympathetic towards Pope John Paul II and evidently believes in his inspired mission, argues that discipline and papal authority have broken down in the Church and that the Pope has permitted this pending that sign from the heavens promised by Our Lady of Fatima, which will herald John Paul's assumption of moral and spiritual leadership over the whole world. The sign in the sky, which the Pope is convinced will be manifest, manifested soon, is accompanied by the second coming of Mary, predicted by the first apparition at Fatima. There clearly is a disciplinary problem in the Roman Catholic Church with considerable resistance on both the conservative and liberal wings to the Pope's policies, especially among the Church's leading thinkers. As with the finances, an impression may sometimes be given that matters are getting out of control. However, the great majority of Roman Catholics remain unswervingly loyal to the pontiff and to the authority of the Vatican, instead of the authority of the God, eh? the God of the Bible. And the discipline of the whole institution is perceived by the public at large, at least to remain as solid as ever. The unequivocal positions apparently adopted by the present Pope his firmness with liberal theologians, his strong moral stance, all go down well with committed Catholics and, significantly, with many evangelicals too. The Anglo-Catholic newsletter Ecclesia noted in December 1990 that, quote, the present Pope is doing a great deal to return his church to better ways after the appalling mess caused by the spirit of Vatican II. Unquote. Quite how John Paul II manages to retain the allegiance of serious Catholics while, in step with the utterances of the Madonna of Magigorgi, he embraces other faiths, is beyond rational understanding. And this finishes on page 166, the reading from today, from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth, from the book All Roads Lead to Rome, chapter 14, Persecution and Inquisition, and chapter 15, Concern of Roman Catholics. Concern of Roman Catholics. The first concern of Roman Catholics should be that they do not adhere to the Bible and they do not adhere to the word of God and that they are deceived by the man of sin. That should be the first and foremost concern of Roman Catholics. That of course was not subject of this little chapter that I just read. And this of course is not subject of any Roman Catholic anyway because they think that their catechism which is a compilation of Bible teaching and man teaching, is much more worth than Bible teaching the Word of God alone. And that's why, if a Roman Catholic is not returning back to the Bible, he will always be a lost soul. And that is why I hope that you all understand that I am not speaking against Catholics, against the people, but I am speaking against the hierarchy and the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church, which has its roots in Babylon. As you of course know, when you followed my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion, and maybe the reading of Rulers of Evil, and maybe the reading of Behind the Dictators, and this one, and maybe the next one, then you will finally understand 
that Roman Catholicism is not Christianity, as it is also stated in this book, as I've read again and again and again and over and over and over again. So that finishes my reading for today, and Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says, God bless you, until next time, and bye bye. We, as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many, and so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take the information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of. And that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.